Good morning. My name is Jenny Webb, and it is an honor to read from God's Word today. Join me by turning to the book of Romans, chapter 11. Romans, chapter 11, verses 25 through 36. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been dis that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Thanks, Jenny. Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Good to see all of you. Even if I only get to see part of your face for now, I know you're out there. And I can see the smiles in your eyes. Or frowns, as the case may be. Well, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the director of ministries here at Fellowship Bible Church, and it's my honor this morning to bring to you the next message in our series through the book of Romans called Live by Faith. Isn't that right? Live by Faith? Okay, yeah. It sounded wrong when I said it out loud. Live by Faith. Uh, if you haven't already done so, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Romans 11, 25. The Sherlock Holmes short story... The Adventure of the Dancing Men begins with Sherlock Holmes and his trusted friend and assistant, Dr. Watson, sitting in the common sitting room in their rooms on Baker Street. They're, they've been sitting there silently for a few hours, each man absorbed in his own thoughts, when Holmes breaks the silence by saying, So, Watson, you do not propose to invest in South African securities. Watson is startled and astonished because it seemed like Holmes just read his mind because he had not shared this information with Holmes. <clears throat> and so, of course, Watson asks how in the world he knew that. So Holmes then explains his sequence of reasoning that led him to this startlingly accurate conclusion. It began with the fact that he had observed the previous night that when Watson had returned from his club, he had chalk between his left finger and thumb, which told him that Watson had been playing billiards. And he knew that Watson only played billiards with one particular friend. And he remembered four weeks previously that Watson had mentioned this friend had asked him to join with him on this investment in South African securities. And finally, Watson kept his checkbook. I guess he used cash more often. Of course, they didn't have credit cards. Kept his checkbook locked in Holmes' desk. And Watson had not asked Holmes for the key. Therefore, Holmes knew that he was not going to invest in these South African securities. Well, once he Watson said, how absurdly simple. And Holmes, of course, was a bit annoyed and irritated at this because when he explained how he had arrived at it, Watson was less impressed with his abilities. In fact, Holmes said, uh, next page, sorry. Holmes said, every problem becomes very childish when it is explained to you. And it's like that in life. Whenever something uh, may appear just brilliant or impressive, when you see its inner workings or you find out maybe the secret behind it, you're often less impressed with it than you were before. Uh, for instance, a magic trick is like that, right? You can be amazed by a magic trick and then you see the secret behind it. And then the next time you see the magic trick, it just doesn't have the same kind of punch. Well, in today's passage, God tells us some of the inner workings of his plan. He gives us some of his secrets, and instead of leaving unimpressed, it will increase our awe and our humility before our triune God. So let's set the, uh, set the uh, stage for this passage. 
beginning way back in Romans chapter 9. How many of you guys remember when that happened? Is that six weeks ago? Todd remembers it. <laughs> way back at the beginning of chapter 9, Paul started this discussion regarding the nation of Israel. And so he's been carrying on for uh, now almost three full chapters. And throughout this time, he's emphasized the sovereignty of God. He's emphasized the justice of God and the faithfulness of God to his promises. Now, at the time this was written, as you know, Jews, by and large, rejected Jesus, their Messiah, which, of course, is the case today as well. However, once the gospel message started spreading to Gentile areas, Gentiles were coming to Christ in droves. The gospel ministry, ministry among Gentiles was flourishing. Now, since the Jews are, of course, God's chosen people, the whole situation seemed somewhat incoherent and confusing. So the Spirit of God moved Paul to answer many of the questions that Israel's status had raised. And in today's passage, he's going to wrap up this whole discussion by telling us about a glorious mystery. This section starts with a very straightforward statement of this mystery, which is this. God has partially and temporarily hardened Israel. God has partially and temporarily hardened Israel. Now, I realize it is out of the ordinary to have a sermon point with two adverbs. But as you will see, it was necessary in this case. So read with me once again, Romans 11, verse 25. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now, before Paul states this mystery, he first tells us why he's even explaining it. Lest you be wise in your own sight. In other, in other words, so that you won't be arrogant, so that you won't be conceited, I want you to understand this mystery. The previous passage makes it clear that you is referring to Gentile believers. The Spirit wants Gentile believers in particular to uh, understand this mystery. Now, why is that? Why is it that this particular explanation is pointed at Gentile believers? Well, last week, as you'll recall, Todd explained Paul's image of the olive tree in verses 17 through 24. Unbelieving Israelites, which rep were represented by branches in the olive tree, were cut off. From the root of the olive tree, which was God's saving plan, and believing Gentiles, who were represented by uh, branches from a wild olive tree, were grafted into the root of God's saving plan. That knowledge brings with it the temptation to be wise in your own sight. Gentiles might sinfully think that they're responding to the gospel more readily than the Israelites because they're wise, because they're more spiritually insightful. The Jews rejected Jesus, but we Gentiles are embracing him. We are better. We are more spiritually wise than they are. And that, of course, is absolutely wrong. A true understanding of God and his plan removes any basis for pride or boasting. As Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God one may boast. You did not trust Christ because you were more spiritually sensitive or wiser or a better person than anyone else on earth. You trusted Christ because the Holy Spirit opened your eyes to see the truth of the gospel. And God's want, God wants you to understand this mystery to prevent you as a Gentile from thinking that you're in some way superior to the Jews who rejected Israel. What's interesting is this is kind of a reverse case of what happened among the Israelites. The Israelites, as you know, became spiritually conceited because they thought we have been favored by God. Therefore, we're better people than the Gentiles. And that, of course, is untrue. And now Paul's taking the other side and saying, Gentiles, you're not better than the Jews either. <clears throat> God wants you to understand this mystery to prevent you as a Gentile from thinking that you're in some way superior to the Jews who have rejected the gospel. Now, this word mystery in the New Testament is used to mean a truth that was previously hidden but has now been revealed. For instance, Ephesians 3 talks about the mystery of Jews and Gentiles being united in one body through the saving work of Jesus Christ. That was always part of God's plan, but it has only been revealed in these last days. So when you see the word mystery, don't think of it as something that can't be understood. Think of it sort of like the word secret. It's hidden and now it's been revealed. Paul states the mystery this way. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The hardening is partial. Not every Israelite 
rejected their Messiah. Paul, Peter, James, John, Mary, and on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 Jews trusted Christ as Messiah and re received the forgiveness and salvation that he offers. The hardening is not only partial, but it's temporary. It lasts until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. <clears throat> now, do you see how that works against the temptation to pride for Gentiles to be wise in their own sight? The reason that most of Israel is rejecting Christ is that they have been hardened. They aren't more dull. They aren't more worldly than Gentiles. They have been hardened. And as Todd mentioned just a few weeks ago, this hardening is a judicial hardening. In other words, it is judgment upon the nation of Israel for their rejection of their Messiah when he came to them. The hardening will be lifted, though. It will not last forever. It will be lifted when the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Has come in to what? Well, he's talking about the full number of the chosen, the elect Gentiles, when they have come into the kingdom of God through trusting Christ as their Messiah. At that time, and no one knows when that will be, at that time, God will lift this judgment of hardening. The second thing you need to understand about this mystery is this. Israel's hardening will result in Israel's salvation. Israel's hardening will result in Israel's salvation. Look again at verses 26 through 29. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. In this way, all Israel will be saved. What a statement. What does that mean? Through this partial hardening that God has given as a judgment, through that hardening, Israel will be saved. A key truth to keep in mind when you're reading the New Testament is that there are two senses in which the word Israel is used. There is physical Israel, which includes everyone who is descendant from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Ethnic Jews would be another way to understand that. And then there is spiritual Israel, and that consists of everyone who has trusted in Christ and has been united to Christ and placed into the kingdom of God. Now, in this case, he is talking about physical or ethnic Israel all, when he says all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved when this hardening is lifted. And surprisingly, he said it's because of this hardening that it's even going to happen. When it says all Israel, keep in mind that it's not saying every single person that is alive at that time that is a descendant of Jacob. Because if that was the case, then we'd be back to salvation by physical descent which has never and will be never, will never be, will be never, will never be part of God's plan. In saying God, all Israel, however, God is saying that a large majority of the nation, at whatever time this hardening is lifted, will come to Christ. They will be awakened and they will be saved. In support of this promise, uh, Paul puts together a statement based on Isaiah 59, Isaiah 27, and Jeremiah 31. He says, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So that gives us a little bit of a clue as to when this awakening, this mighty revival among Israelites is going to happen. Who is the deliverer? Y'all can answer. Jesus, that's right. It's the, the Sunday school answer is exactly right this time. Jesus is the deliverer. It can only be Jesus because it says the deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Now think about the great leaders that Israel has had in the past. David was called a man after God's own heart. God used him to write a number of the Psalms as well as to lead Israel into uh, great battles and victories. But he could not banish ungodliness from Israel. Hezekiah was a godly king. He had idols torn down. He had idol worshipers pushed out and he uh, in, encourage the wor true worship of the one true God, but he could not banish ungodliness from Jacob. There is only one man of whom this could possibly be true, and that, of course, is Jesus of Nazareth. He is the only one that has the power and the authority to banish ungodliness from Jacob, meaning Israel. And it is only through Jesus, of course, that sins can be taken away. You know, in the Old Testament, God set up this uh, sacrificial system 
to atone for the sins of Israel. But then we found out in the New Testament, basically that was kind of like a placeholder. It was a picture of what Jesus was going to do because the book of Hebrews says it was impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. All that could do is picture what Jesus was going to do because only the blood of Jesus Christ can take away sin. Now think for just a second about the glory of that time. All Israel will be saved. Now currently, there is a population of around 11 million Jews worldwide. If I remember my numbers correctly. <clears throat> so if a majority, let's pretend for a second that when God says all Israel, he means at least 51%. So that would be at least 5.5 million Jews coming to Christ. And since this is talked about as an event, the deliverer will come and he will banish this ungodliness. He will take away their sins. What I'm imagining is in this short span of time, you're going to see millions of Jews trusting Christ, repenting of their sins, trusting Christ, and coming to faith in him. So when is that going to happen? Well, since it requires the coming of the deliverer, and since the deliverer is Jesus, is going to happen when Jesus returns. Now, as you know, the return of Jesus is sort of a span of a number of events that are happening. So I'm not going to try to place it in, in that kind of, in a specific spot in that span. All I'm going to say is this. One day, Jesus is going to return bodily to this earth, and he is going to banish ungodliness from Israel, and he is going to bring millions of Jews to their rightful place in the kingdom of God. Now, after this beautiful promise, Paul describes the paradoxical place of Israel in this current era of their hardening. He says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. With regard to the gospel, they are enemies. They oppose the preaching of the gospel. They oppose the church. They fight against those who teach about Jesus. I ran across something this week happening in Israel. It was actually an article of a, uh, on an Israeli website. And uh, they were talking about the fact that evangelical Christians in the United States have been some of the biggest supporters in the world for Israel. And, and praise God and, and thank him for that. And so they were, they were actually talking about evangelicals in a positive light. But they were worried because there is an evangelical, uh, what do you call it, television network. I'll spit it out in a second. That had gotten a license to be able to broadcast in Israel. And they discovered that this... These programs would be intended for Jewish people. In other words, they're going to try to convert Jews to trust in their Messiah. Which, as you and I know, is not mean that you deny your Jewishness, but that you actually fulfill your Jewishness and you, you trust in your Messiah. So anyway, these people, they were worried about this. And they were basically raising a hand to protest. Say, hold on, we should not grant these people the right to broadcast because they're going to be preaching the gospel to Jews in this country. So right now Jews are enemies of the gospel. They are opposing the gospel. But strangely, God says that they're enemies for your sake. The Gentiles are enemy, excuse me, the Jews are Gentiles. <laughs> I'll stop. The Jews are enemies for the sake of Gentiles. What in the world does that mean? Well, we'll get to that in just a minute because he's going to expand upon it. So the current state's bad, but it's for your good is what he's saying. Israel is an enemy of the gospel, but on the other hand, they are also beloved of God. Beloved by God with regard to election. In other words, with regard to God's choice of Israel as his people. Because of God's choice of Israel to be his people, the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are beloved for the sake of these ancestors with whom God, has, God made his covenant directly. So even though Israel is an enemy of God in one sense because they're fighting against the gospel, they are still beloved of God for the sake of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the promises and covenants that God had given them. And one day, praise God, Israel will be saved. One day when God has removed this hardening, he will send a mighty awakening drawing them to Christ. This glorious end is an example of God's faithfulness to his promise and covenant. And then verse 29 adds, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts given to Israel, these covenants, these promises, the revelations, the patriarchs, they can never be taken away. The calling of Israel to be God's chosen people will never be taken away. God is not going to unchoose Israel. It cannot be revoked. 
Deuteronomy 7, 6 says this about Israel. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. That is still true, and it will always be true. It cannot be revoked. That is why Israel's hardening will ultimately result in Israel's salvation. Despite their rejection of Christ, despite their violent battle against the gospel, Israel is still beloved and all Israel will be saved because God is faithful. Throughout the Old Testament, God repeatedly sent prophets to call Israel out on their sin, to call them to repentance, and to regularly promise that there is coming a day when the Messiah will set all things right and bring Israel back into relationship with himself. Even though that seemed impossible in Paul's day, and it looks impossible in our day, God wants every believer to know that he will save Israel as he promised. And that salvation will come as a result of this hardening. Which leads to the next point in the passage. Israel's hardening is a channel of God's mercy. Israel's hardening is a channel of God's mercy. Look at verses 30 to 32. For just as you were at one time disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they too have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may now receive mercy. For God has consigned all to disobedience that he may have mercy on all. Now that, that sequence is somewhat confusing to, watch, uh, to read because he's switching tenses and switching people and he's switching between mercy and disobedience. But it's really just a fascinating chain of events. So let's break it down. The Gentiles, meaning all of the peoples of the earth outside of Israel, were disobedient to God as a group. They rejected the one true God, even though he revealed himself through nature. And they worshipped idols of their own making. He talks about that in Romans chapter 1. He says that they did not honor God as God or give thanks to him. But they, they, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. So once again, there's nothing to be proud of, right? <laughs> that we somehow deserved God's blessing. No, Gentiles were disobedient to God as a people. All the nations of God, they were pagan and they were rebelling against him. How did they receive mercy? They received mercy, he says, because of Israel's disobedience. So how did that happen? Well, Jesus comes to Israel, the Messiah, and he was rejected by and large. Most of the people and most of the leaders denounced him. And then later, as the church was growing in Jerusalem, Israel began to openly persecute the church. Because of this, many Christians left Israel for safer areas, such as Samaria. And as a result of them going to these other areas, the gospel came to non-Israelites because these people shared the gospel wherever they went. In addition to that, when Paul went on his first missionary journey, he would always begin his ministry in the synagogue of the city that he was visiting. And whenever the Jews would rise up in opposition to it, he would basically say, okay, now I'm going to the Gentiles. I gave you your chance. I gave you the gospel. You're rejecting it. I'm going to the Gentiles. So it was because of the disobedience of the Jews that more Gentiles are now hearing the gospel and therefore receiving God's mercy. Israel's disobedience brought the mercy of God to Gentiles. You received mercy because of Israel's disobedience. So then this chain of God's mercy continues by returning back to Israel. Paul points out that they have now become disobedient in order to receive mercy. And they receive mercy by the mercy shown to us Gentiles. How can that be? Well, one way was mentioned in last week's passage. Whenever Gentiles are coming to Christ, as they have been all over the world, we are now worshiping the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We love the nation of Israel. We love the Old Testament. And we are experiencing the joy and the fulfillment that comes from a relationship with the one true God. Whereas Israelites, by and large, cold toward God, can be stirred to jealousy by saying, wow, these, these people are like in love with Yahweh. They're lifting him up, they're honoring him, they're in relationship with him, and it stirs up jealousy in the heart of these Jewish people to open them to say, okay, maybe there's something to this Jesus being the Messiah. So that's one way that they can receive mercy 
through our reception of mercy. And another way is exactly what's happening with this place that wants to uh, broadcast in Israel. Gentiles take the gospel to Jews. There are ministries all over the world that are specifically aimed toward Jewish people. And that, that is a way for us who have received mercy to give that same mercy to the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you tell an ethnic Jew about the Lord Jesus and his saving work, you are being a channel of God's mercy to Israel. Now, after talking about the disobedience of Gentiles and the disobedience of Israel, the Spirit then adds, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. He has consigned or bound or shut up all to disobedience. The picture is sort of like putting us in a cell. Jews and Gentiles have been imprisoned in disobedience. Now that doesn't mean that God caused Jews and Gentiles to disobey. What it means is he gave us up to our disobedience to remove any hope of salvation from our own goodness or merit. God saves purely by mercy and he forces mankind to experience their disobedience so that they may call upon him for mercy. You'll remember early in the book of Romans, that was one thing that Paul continually harped on was Gentiles are condemned and deserve the wrath of God because they are sinners. Jews are condemned and deserve the wrath of God because they are sinners. That is God saying, look, I'm putting all of you guys in this prison called disobedience of your own making so that now I can offer you salvation purely on mercy. First, Gentiles as a people were in disobedience through idolatry and unchecked sin. And then Jews as a people were in disobedience through their rejection of Jesus the Messiah. And God used and is continuing to use Israel's hardening as a channel of his mercy to disobedient sinners. Praise God and amen for that. Israel's hardening is partial and temporary. It will result in Israel's salvation and it's a channel of God's mercy. That is a glorious mystery. But we're not done yet. The final section of this passage tells us one more magnificent truth. God's greatness is displayed in his dealings with Israel and the Gentiles. I want you guys to think back. For some of you, this will be a short journey. For some of you, a very long journey. Think back to when you were a teenager. Nobody's grimacing. Y'all have pretty good teenage years? Good. Think back to when you were a teenager. When your parents made a decision that you didn't understand, how did you react internally? I don't mean outwardly. Some of us that were raised in East Texas knew that if we reacted the wrong way outwardly, there would be pain involved. So how did you react internally when your parents made a decision that you didn't understand? Now probably, like me, you often thought that your parents didn't really understand how the world, work, how the world works. They don't understand me. They don't understand life. They just don't get it. They're not hip. Now, think for a second about how you react today. So now let's, let's leave the teenage years. Let's come back to where we are. Think about how you react when God says something in his word that you don't understand or that you don't agree with. Do you respond like the teen who doubts his parents' intelligence? I'm afraid that many believers do just that with God. Oh, God said greed is a sin? I don't really think that's right. I don't, I don't think he really understands the way the world works. God punishes people in hell? I don't think he's as good as he says he is. I, I, don't, I don't think he's as loving as he says he is. That is not the response of faith and submission. The response of faith is found in verses 33 through 36. So look at them again with me. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments, how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor, or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Paul finished this discussion of God's plans regarding Israel and the nations of the world. A discussion, as I mentioned before, he began way back in chapter 9. And he ends by responding in worship. Paul marvels at the awe-inspiring greatness of God. Now, I can say confidently that Paul did not fully understand why God chose to do what he did. 
I can say confidently that Paul did not fully comprehend this mystery of Israel's partial hardening, which would then result in mercy to the Gentiles and back to Israel. Because he said God's judgments are unsearchable. His ways are inscrutable. In the Greek New Testament, I discovered that unsearchable and inscrutable are actually the same Greek word. The uh, English translations wanted to vary the uh, diction, I suppose. But both of those words mean something that is impossible to understand, unfathomable. God's judgments, God's decisions cannot be fully understood. His ways, his actions, his doings cannot be fully understood by finite man. So I know that Paul didn't completely understand why God chose to harden Israel in order to show mercy to the Gentiles and to eventually save Israel. But Paul responded in awe, not doubt. When God doesn't make sense to you, let that be a reminder that he is a higher intellect than you are. He is supreme and infinite in his knowledge and wisdom. Our inability to fully grasp God, what God is doing should be a motivation to praise not a motivation to doubt. After all, God has proven beyond any doubt that he is good and loving by sending his own son to die on the cross for our sins. God has demonstrated time and again that he is everything that he says he is. So don't let questions that you can't answer lead you to doubt God's goodness, character, or wisdom. Ask the questions by all means. Ponder them. Work through them. Think them through. Try to arrive at an answer. But when you can't resolve the questions, don't take that as evidence that God isn't quite who he claims to be. It's evidence instead that God is far beyond you. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, God says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are, my, are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. There are probably hundreds of things about God, what he's done and what he said in scripture that we can't understand. And that should, be, that should be expected. The difference between God's intellect and our intellect is infinitely greater than the distance between your mind and the mind of a sea slug. Of course, we won't always understand God. One of God's attributes, in fact, is incomprehensibility, which means that we will never fully understand and know everything there is to understand and know about God because God is infinite and transcendent far, far above us. And praise God that he is. Don't dare worship someone that you can completely understand or completely relate to. There is only one worthy of worship, and that's the one who is far beyond our comprehension. So when Paul surveyed what God was doing, he saw that God's plan was something that he would never have come up with. He saw that he couldn't figure out why God was doing things this way, and he chose then to praise God. His riches and wisdom and knowledge are deep, too deep for human understanding. And to underscore God's greatness, Paul quotes from Isaiah 40, which makes the point that no one knows God's mind and no one has ever given him advice. The only way we can know what God is thinking is when he chooses to reveal it to us. And because he is the exalted king of the universe, he needs no one's advice or counsel for his plans or decisions. He adds another Old Testament quote in verse 35. Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? That's from Job 41.11. It tells us that God owes no man anything. Every blessing God gives is undeserved and unearned. God doesn't owe salvation to anyone. He doesn't owe mercy to anyone. So the fact that God gives mercy, the God, fact that God gives free salvation is a testimony to both his goodness and his kindness. The final verse in this passage is a celebration of the sovereignty of God. For from him and through him and to him are all things. God is the source and the means and the goal of human history and the great plan of redemption. Everything revolves around God and is intended to bring him glory. And God, in fact, chose to even further narrow that focus by exalting one person of the Trinity in particular, his son Jesus, and pressing everything toward his glory and exaltation. Paul himself responded to this sweeping statement by adding, To him be glory forever. Amen. And that sums up the purpose of all of creation. It sums up the purpose of all of human history. It sums up the purpose for which you were created and for which you breathe. To give God glory forever. And then he ended it with amen. So be it. 
The purpose of your life is to bring glory to God. And Christian, God saves you to bring glory to himself. Glory for his mercy, for his grace, for his goodness. And God is perfectly, totally, and fully worthy of glory. God's greatness is displayed in his dealings with Israel and the Gentiles. Now, I suspect if you would think through this mystery, and I encourage you to do that, there will be questions of justice that arise in your mind. One of mine is, well, it seems kind of unfair that God hardened Israel starting back in Jesus' day. They're still hardened today, but he's one day going to save Israel. So what about the majority of the nation in all this time? That doesn't seem just and fair to me. But all I can do is say, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. Your judgments are too deep for me. The dominant theme of this passage is this. God displays his glory by hardening Israel to save Gentiles and Israel. God displays his glory by hardening Israel to save Gentiles and Israel. His plan to gather a people under the kingship of his son from Israel and the nations is being accomplished through the hardening of his covenant people. Now, only a being of superior intellect could make a plan like that. And as is common throughout scripture, God is, God's workings seem upside down to human wisdom. God displays his glory by hardening Israel to save Gentiles and Israel. Now that truth in and of itself is edifying and necessary because it exalts the wisdom and the mercy and the transcendence of God. But, but I also want to leave you with a more personal word this morning, an implication of this big truth, which is this. God hardened Israel to save you. God hardened Israel to save you. That is an awesome thought, isn't it? God hardened his chosen people in order to bring you to faith in Jesus Christ. If you're a Gentile, which I assume probably all of us in here are, then God hardened Israel in order to cause the spread of the gospel outside of Israel and ultimately to North America. If you're a Jew, then God hardened Israel in order to bring about save, uh, salvation among the Gentiles to spark jealousy in your heart to bring you to faith in Christ. God hardened Israel to save you. That is how much he loves you. Now, if you aren't a believer, think about this. God loves you so much that he hardened his chosen people to spread the gospel around the world so that you could hear the good news today. Jesus of Nazareth, the son of God, lived a perfect life and gave his life on a Roman cross to pay the penalty for your sins. He was buried and on the third day he rose again. And now he offers life, forgiveness, and salvation to everyone who will trust in him. Believe the good news. Turn to him and ask him to forgive you, to save you. He will not turn anyone away. Now back to the church. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God has given us a word today. And God's word always demands a response. I've come up with a few suggestions for you. They'll be displayed on the screen behind me as well as on the uh, sermon notes. I want to focus on the last one, though. <clears throat> Share one truth from this passage with someone else this week. Now, here's one of the things I had in mind. Suppose you know a fellow believer that is struggling, that is perplexed, maybe despairing and even depressed about what God is doing or not doing in their lives. As an opportunity for you to lovingly point them toward the transcendence of God. That because he is so far above us and so highly intelligent that we will not understand what he is doing. But that is not evidence that God is unloving or mean or uncaring. In fact, his son is always and eternally evidence of just the opposite. Or perhaps you're having a discussion with an unbeliever, friend, relative, co-worker. You can simply mention to them what are the things that you took from the sermon this morning. That you were reminded of God's greatness. That you were reminded of God's love. That you were reminded that God moved heaven and earth to save you. And will do the same for them. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven. In the name of your precious son Jesus I come to you. And my heart is full Lord God. My heart is full because I have experienced the gathering of the body this morning. We have sung your praises together. We have heard your word. We have prayed. And now, Lord God, we turn our hearts and our minds toward you. 
And I ask for grace to be poured out on everyone in this room, everyone that's listening online. I pray, oh God, for a special measure of grace. Stir up once again gratitude, awe, love, and wonder at you because of your greatness, because of the mercy that you have demonstrated to us. And God, I pray that you would make us a channel of your mercy to others. Oh God, we love you because of all that you are and all that you have done. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for your faithfulness. I pray, oh God, that you would use us this week to bring, use us this week to bring glory to your name. In your holy name, amen. We will have uh, some people, if you're interested in uh, having someone pray with you or for you, there'll be people uh, in the desk to my right the south side, those of you who care about directions of the uh, foyer. <clears throat> so I invite you to take advantage of that. If there's something that you're struggling with or perplexed about, they would just be overjoyed to pray with you. So let me just say this. God bless you this week. Walk in his love. Rest in his love. And may God bless you in all that you do. <clears throat>